channel which focuses mostly on the comparative issue, practicing comparison, faces of populism and anti-populism. Our first speaker is Anastasia Eliadeli, uh, who is um, doing her PhD uh, in our school. And her title is Populism and the New Extreme Right, Ways to Apply. Anastasia. Uh, thank you for the invitation to participate in this very interesting three-day workshop on populism. Um, the title of my presentation is Populism and the New Extreme Right, Ways to Apply. So basically the topic focuses on populism of the new extreme right and on how, as researchers, we can use the concept of populism uh, in order to understand the new extreme right. So I will restrict myself to this particular thematic area. In this presentation, we seek to shed light on the ways the theory of populism is applied by researchers in the analytical approaches of the new extreme right phenomenon. We argue that populism constitutes an interpretive tool that is highly applied in the analysis of the new extreme right. And we try to make a point by arguing that not only does the theory of populism provide a descriptive frame for the understanding of the rise of the European extreme right, but also that it is exactly through the use of populism that one can clearly understand the anti-systemic character of the extreme right political family. First, we will present the basic definitions of populism and extreme right that dominate in the relevant bibliography. Second, we will analyze the thematic categories which show how populism and new extreme right intermingle in practice. In the last part of our presentation, we will make some critical observations regarding the implications populism has on contemporary extreme right parties in Europe. When referring to the term populism, either to the political theory of populism or to the typologies constructed to define it, and in spite of the numerous different interpretive approaches to define the populist phenomenon, we will provide a minimal definition for the term. According to Germani, populism is the worship of the values of the people. It is actually the conflict between the people and the elites that lies at the heart of the populist rhetoric. Led either by a charismatic person or simply a demagogue, populist movements give voice to excluded social groups that strongly anticipate entering the political system. And this is an argument made by Germani, Ionescu and Geldner, Canavan, Laclau, uh, Mude, and Tagev. As far as the term extreme right is concerned, despite its conceptual and ideological ambiguity, something that is reflected in the different labels of radical right, far right, uh, uh, national populist right, populist right, extreme right, the term could, however, be summed up, according to Yoriadu, to the features of authoritarianism, populist anti-statism or welfare chauvinism. As it has characteristically been pointed out by Ignazzi, the new extreme right, the so-called post-fascist, post-materialist extreme right, promotes post-materialist demands. In this context, the new extreme right perceives the state as an ethno-cultural, homogeneous community replacing the principle of equality with that of national preference, thereby identifying democracy with a plebiscitary and authoritarian form of governance which is opposed to foreigners. And this is an argument that has been supported by Ignazzi, Mude, Taggart, Yuryav. In line with the above, Mude holds that populism constitutes an ideology that considers society to be separated into two homogeneous and antagonistic groups, namely the pure people and the corrupt elite, and which argues that politics should express the general will of the people. This ideology has some very specific characteristics. It is opposed to elitism and pluralism, and it can be easily combined with very different other ideologies. 
What it actually provides, it's a Manichaean distinction between the elite and the people. That means a bipolar relationship, which is highly penetrated by a moralistic rather than pragmatic view of the world. Populism thus, according to uh, Meni and Cyril, exalts the good, wise, authentic, and simple people, while at the same time rejects the corrupt, incompetent, and interlocking elites, something that gives populism an anti-system flavor common in extreme right political discourse. Today, in a period of a complex sociopolitical and economic crisis, the term populism is highly associated with extreme right taking also into consideration that, as Muda stresses, the distinction between the people and the nation is far from clear. According to Taggart, the populist conception of the people is monolithic, unified, and solidaristic by singling out particular social groups. The populist constituency is thus defined in terms of who is excluded, in this regard, it is important to focus on the fact that extreme right populism constructs the notion of people using the concept of the heartland. On one hand, by excluding those outside the nation, whereas on the other hand, by not including all those inside the nation. Therefore, the heartland is a tool for making sense of the extreme right populist invocation of the people constitutes, according to Taggart, a qualified nationalism that conceives the people as an organic community with natural solidarity. That is the reason why researchers in the field, such as Goodwin and Mude, have used the term nativism to describe the ideological basis according to which populist extreme right parties construct their identity. This identity is considered to be in danger, especially in regard to the new international order. In this context, populist extreme right parties are ethno-nationalist and xenophobic parties that through a firm rejection of the principle of human equality seek to strengthen the nation by making it more ethnically and culturally homogeneous. In order for this ethnic homogeneity to be achieved, the perception of the people by extreme right populism is organic and nationalist. In other words, it is realized through the criterion of culture. This culture-based conception of the people by the new extreme right leads to policies of exclusion, differentialist racism, and xenophobia, often incorporated by a paranoid conspiratorial worldview with Islamophobic and, in some cases, anti-Semitic aspects. In consequence, this interpretation of the people contributes to the construction of the enemy who is represented by the foreign immigrant and who constitutes a threat not only for the welfare state and employment opportunities of the silent majority, but also, and most importantly, for the preservation of the homogeneity and identity of the nation itself. Faced with this challenge, extreme right populist parties either apply policies of national preference and welfare state chauvinism, or turn to the complete rejection of social groups that are considered as unable to assimilate. This racist obsession, obsession to preserve the ethnocultural difference of the national community is practically expressed through the extreme rights opposition to immigration. This tendency to be always against is what actually provides the clearest interpretive frame for the populist ideology. For populism, anti-party as well as anti-establishment sentiments play a significant role, calling for a new kind of political representation that does not undermine the interests of the people and above all does not corrupt the link between the leader and supporters. In these terms, populist extreme right parties are pursuing a struggle against politics, against the legal system, and against the media. Therefore, populism incarnates an attack on the nature of political parties, as well as on the form that representative politics has come to take in countries where it flourishes. 
According, uh, arguing that the state is dominated either by an elite consensus or by organized interests, populist parties radically criticize contemporary representative politics as dysfunctional. As a reaction to this malfunctioning, populism can either take the form of a political mobilization or that of a protest party. Either as a political movement or as a protest party, populism adopts anti-party and anti-establishment stances which reflect its aim to reform the representative system of democracy and to provoke drastic changes in the institutions. And that uh, by means of a greater use of tools of direct democracy. Taking into consideration the above mentioned regarding the anti-establishment rhetoric of populist parties, the populist strategy dichotomizes issues into good and evil and seeks to repress difference and extinguish dissenting voices, thereby ignoring functions such as compromise and bargaining, which constitute fundamental aspects of pluralist and democratic societies. Apart from their anti-institutional and anti-pluralist character, populist protest parties also react against the type of a heavily bureaucratized welfare state and denunciate the corruption and collusion of established political parties. And it is on this ground which moves decisively against the system that populist parties occasionally mobilize small but considerable parts of the population. In their attempt to move away from the dominant, from the systemic way traditional parties are organized, Populist extreme right parties appeal to the common people, strives first of all to appeal to their common sense. As mentioned above, populism has an inherent distrust towards political institutions in general and political parties in particular. However, while expressing this distrust, populist movements or parties also try to voice popular dissatisfaction, resentment, and frustration, and articulate the demands and sentiments of the ordinary people. To clarify our point, as symptoms of the democratic malaise that has appeared due to the loss of the agonistic nature of democracy, populist extreme right parties take advantage of the gap that the crisis of democracy has produced for their own benefit. It is when political elites and representative institutions fail to confront successfully with this problem that populist leaders instrumentalize in their polemic discourse the pathos of the little man. This redemptive feature that transforms the popular appeal into an appeal of hatred towards the elites lies at the core of the populist rhetoric. We may so far sum up the following two points. First, contemporary populist fever should be perceived as a symptom of the democratic malaise. In this sense, we should conceive populism as the instrumentalization of this democratic malaise by extreme right anti-political movements and leaders. Secondly, and in this regard, what populism does is to organize and instrumentalize the basic features of a unique extreme right rhetoric, such as the Manichaean outlook, the feelings of resentment and frustration, the anti-representation, anti-establishment, anti-politics, and anti-pluralist stance, the policy of welfare chauvinism, the idea of national identity and national sovereignty, the construction of the people as an organic community, the construction of the enemy, and the anti-immigration attitude. Following an approach that categorizes the parties of the right political family according to their level of extremism, one could argue that the most extreme version of an organization belonging to the right side of the political spectrum could be identified with fascism. However, uh, this would be a false conclusion to draw, since, as it has already been mentioned, by rejecting the way the representative system works, the new extreme right does not aim at the unconditional dissolution of democracy, as fascism does. Moreover, in perceiving the new extreme right as the revival of fascism, we may risk ignoring the innovative character of the new extreme right phenomenon. 
Let us be more, let us be more precise on this point. Identifying extreme right with fascism would lead us to adopt an essentialist perception of the former, something that would result in its dehistoricization, which in turn would pose great difficulty in our comprehension and analysis not only of the new ideological political profile of the extreme right, but also of its metamorphosis caused by different social, political, economic, and cultural conditions. Most importantly, identifying the two political categories of the right with one another would render us unable to realize the rise of the new issues of identity and sovereignty that the new extreme right uses so as to formulate its response to the challenge of globalization and Europeanization. More specifically, it is on the ground of identity that the parties of the new extreme right construct their xenophobic strategies, something that should warn us that in order to fully understand this phenomenon, one must not attribute it only to economic criteria, but also, and most importantly, to the criterion of identity, often combined with national or cult cultural characteristics that is considered to be at risk. To express it another way, what the new extreme right does is through the instrumentalization of the immigration issue to construct the notion not only of an economic threat for the indigenous people, but also of a cultural threat that is highly related to their identity in terms of their way of living, customs, and traditions. Therefore, in order to explain the reasons behind the culture anxiety or cultural insecurity of a big part of the population that under these terms sees itself as culturally threatened, one should examine the way both economic and cultural aspects intermingle in the social arena and focus on how the new extreme right political discourse uses this explosive composition to construct the argument of the threatened identity. In this context, national populism, or to use an alternative term, identitarian populism, or in other words, the identity politics that the new extreme right adopts, expressed either through Islamophobia or through the rejection of the new international order, point to the new issues, the new issues that are included in the new extreme right populist rhetoric. In these terms, the extreme right Euroscepticism, for example, apart from its economic causes, is also expressed through the ideological call for the preservation of the national or European identity and of national sovereignty. To put it differently, the so expressed ex extreme right Euroscepticism corresponds to Moody's notion of pathological normalcy since what the new extreme right does is to radicalize the dominant European values that up to today have, have been mainly part of the mainstream party's agenda in democratic societies. In conclusion, the new European extreme right is a populist identitarian right. It is our contention that the analytical category of national populism and or that of identitarian populism offers researchers one of the most useful interpretive tools in order to examine the ideological and political metamorphosis of the new extreme right. Populism thus provides the analytical mechanism to understand the type of social mobilization the extreme right organizes, while identity points to the content and values of the offered meaning. In face of deep economic crisis and due to the inability of national and European political elites to provide reliable solutions for the future, the current identitarian populisms across Europe express in an anti-political way the demand for the return of politics to the public space. These populisms express the need for the political elites to become detached from a routine of managerial and pragmatic political engagement and rather to reinforce the redemptive side of democracy by giving democracy back its lost meaning in order for the democratic malaise to be successfully overcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia. And now to Kostas Papastathis, the University of Luxembourg. 
Populism, Religious Discourse and Radical Right Politics in Contemporary Greece. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank Yanis for the invitation and his team for the organization of this high standard workshop. Um, I will keep it short. Well, the, the present paper seeks to explore the place and conceptualization of populism as an element of both the religious and the Golden Dawn Party discourse and its impact for the party's electoral success. The paper is divided in three parts. First, the paper examines the current political conditions of party volatility and elaborates on the, on the, on the special status of religion within Greek political so culture. Secondly, the paper elaborates on the significance of religion within the party's populist frame. And third, it explores the past religious populist discourse as a factor, among others, for the party's growth. My arguments, my main arguments are two. One, first, that the inclusion of traditional value frames within GD populist discourse has had a legitimizing effect for the religious-oriented segments of society. And second, that religion as a cultural structure has worked as an indirect factor for radical right strengthening via mediating a populist value system. The paper builds on the pathological normalcy thesis or introduced by Mudem namely that the ideological core of the Golden Dome is not alien to the mainstream, the so-called normal pathology thesis, but a radical interpretation of the dominant ideas and values within the Greek society. In this respect, I consider the role of the church as crucial. The sources to be used as data for analysis are the official party and church documents, as well as the public discourse of the leadership. The method of elaborating the material, material is highly influenced by the Essex School. <coughs> so, I, I'm not telling you anything about the Golden Dawn. It's a fascist, autocratic uh, party of the radical right party family. So, uh, the post-democratic Greece has entered after 2010 into an extreme condition and political crisis. This state of affairs has actually led to a party system change for Greek politics. The collapse of the traditional political divide in conjunction to the effective activation of the GD party that exploited political opportunity structures and capitalized public discontent via grassroots activity allowed the electoral boom of the party. On the other hand, uh, I will speak about uh, the church now, the centrality of the religious factor lies on the church's hegemony within Greek society, both from an institutional and a structural perspective. In particular, Greece has a state church that enjoys a legal status under public law, has, receives massive state funding, and enjoys tax privileges. The church's dominant status should be perceived as path-dependent, linked to the high religiosity level of the population that renders the church a primary interest group seeking rents and influencing the decision-making process to its end. As far as party competition is concerned, it might be argued that the so-called modernization cleavage, despite its decline, is actually in effect. In short, the religiosity factor is a relatively strong predictor for structuring partisan alignment. The party volatility and the salience of the radical right signature issues of immigration and securitization have rendered the religious factor of special importance in party politics, especially that within the right party family, forcing both the government 
as well as the other catch-all parties, including the party of Syriza, to legislate in the church's favor. A possible aim of this pro-religious policy is to prevent the large religious electorate from voting the Golden Dawn. This framing effect, however, of the pro-religious policy of the mainstream parties does not mean that the Golden Dawn Party is excluded from this pool of voters. The paper suggests that the Golden Dawn has, in fact, expanded its influence via conceptualizing religion in nativist terms as a criterion for belonging to the people, constructing in parallel a self-image of the custodian of the traditional value system against the secular elites. To this end, the GD interfered in affairs of high symbolic significance for the religious collective conscience, for which the other parties have been reluctant to openly at least advocate due to the risk of alienating the secular segments of their constituencies. The most characteristic example in this respect is the question of the mosque in Athens, in which the, the Golden Dawn invested politically through developing a false image of the protector of the ethnic purity and of religious superiority. Golden Dawn made actually this question a signature issue of its monocultural agenda, lodging formal requests in the parliament and representing this affair as an endeavor to corrupt the national homogeneity. Particularly, the Golden Dawn considered the mosque as a gesture in favor of the immigrants, which put the Orthodox Greek people under persecution. As such, the mosque was represented as an instrument of the alleged internal enemies, the elites, against the people, against the nation, and as part of the international conspiracy for the establishment of the new world order against national integrity. Consequently, the political actor to decide on this question, according to the Golden Dawn, should not be the parliament, but directly the people through the organization of a referendum. In this way, the Mosque affair was conceptualized in populist terms as part of the perpetual divide between the elites and the people. In effect, the Golden Dawn established ownership over themes of alleged religious interest, while transforming their character in line to its racist project. The reference to the, the, reference to the people as an empty signifier was conceptualized contextually as the religious body at large, it has, however, an instrumental character and as such peripheral, reflecting the party's nativist discourse. This state of affairs has at the same time, however, established the Golden Dawn as the political representative of the Islamophobic and anti-immigrant stratums of Greek society, a part of which belongs by all means to the fundamentalist group within the church. The Golden Dawn communication strategy to create bonds with the target audience of the church goers has led the party leadership to articulate, to articulate an even rigorous discourse on questions such as religious education, abortion policy, etc. It seems that the Golden Dawn pro-religious demagogy, as well as the propagation of the idea that any other faith is supposed to be in principle an existential enemy for the monocultural structure of Greece have actually been effective. This is because a part of the religious body legitimized and participated actively in the party's activities. For a part of the people of the church to use a term used by, introduced by Demosthenes Dodos and adopted by Vasiliki Georgiadou and Elias Nikolakopoulos afterwards, the Golden Dawn was not anymore regarded as an outcast, but acquired the one-of-us status, 
representing the protector of the honor and authority of the church against the alleged endeavor of the elites at, and their foreign patrons to transform Greece into a multicultural society. On the other hand, the church, the institutional church, has been reluctant to actively oppose the Golden Dawn and to take part in the created cordon sanitaire against its expansion. From the church's part, there was not a straightforward and homogeneous critique of the Golden Dawn, but an ambivalent stance. There were bishops, probably one only, advocating, uh, uh, no, excuse me, there were bishops advocating in favor as well as openly hostile to the party. However, the great majority of the bishops kept a neutral stance. The church did not condemn the Golden Dawn even in the event of the cold blood assassination of uh, sing, hip hop singer Pavlos Visas. Overall, the church has not declared a war against the party, but limited its intervention at the lowest possible level. By the term war is meant an open clash with the Golden Dawn practices and ideology, as well as an active propaganda within the social body to counteract the party's influence. The question that arises then is why the church has accepted the Golden Dawn strategy to exploit its symbolic capital. The paper argues that the church cannot oppose effectively a political group with which it shares a set of core ideological values and upon which the church has established its hegemony. If, for example, the church articulates an antifiletist discourse, it will actually be inconsistent with its own political tradition. Taking into account that the link between the church and the extreme right has had strong historical roots, my analysis is based on exploring the degree of their ideological proximity. This is done through elaborating on the religious discourse in respect to the central elements or themes of the GD value system, such as authoritarianism, nationalism, populism, etc. Because of the lack of time, I will confine my presentation on the populist aspect. One might argue that the church does not articulate a populist discourse, since the church, the bureaucracy of the church, is actually part of the elites. Well, indeed, the only time that the church in the last five years reacted actively in populist terms was when it called for a referendum in the case the government put in question its financial and tax privileges. In order to understand this interaction in terms of populism between the religious and the Golden Dawn discourse, we should refer on the late Archbishop Christodoulos. So, in the papers of Yanis Stavrakakis. <laughs> this, is, this is because a privileged signifier of Christodoulos' discourse was populism. So, uh, a first common between Christodoulos and the Golden Dawn uh, populist uh, element was that for Christodoulos, the signifier people was conceptualized in monocultural, thus exclusionist terms. Defining the, the us versus them distinction along these lines meant that any faith, except for the Orthodox one, is more or less demonized and should be treated as a corrupting element. Secondly, as Stavrakakis has uh, argued, the church was not perceived by Christodoulos as a mere institution operating within the framework defined by the rule of law, but above law, as the supreme representative of the people, having the sacred duty to protect the people against its alleged enemies, the secularized elites, and their servants, the intellectuals. This populism, however, was a faux populism, like that of the Golden Dawn. On the one hand, there was the ostensible claim for establishing referendum procedures for policy decision-making. On the other hand, the church, 
as part of the collective subject, was self-proclaimed self as the protector of the people who cannot react for themselves and need the Messiah, a, a Messiah to save them. This would be Christodoulos. The final aim, therefore, was to gradually change the existing political norms, not towards a populist, thus true democratic direction, but towards an authoritarian, religious-centered political operation. In conclusion, the paper argues that populism has been a central reference frame for both the GD agenda and the Orthodox Church discourse. This does not mean that the Church institutionally supports neo-Nazi politics, but that there is a certain ideological affinity between them. In particular, it is suggested that the early promotion of populism by the Church has contributed to the late social acceptance of the Golden Dawn propaganda, in the sense that it worked as its ideological breeding ground and created the respective political space. In effect, the current neutral religious policy towards the Golden Dawn is grounded on the fact that an open, an open conflict with the Golden Dawn would bring the church uh, at odds with its own invented myths and ideological founding traditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we pass to our next speaker, which is Yorgos Katsambekis, comparing right-wing and left-wing populisms. Okay, uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really glad uh, to present my paper after uh, two very uh, challenging presentations by Kostas and Anastasia. And I'm uh, going to bring uh, to the discussion uh, also left-wing populism here. Uh, because we have seen that for more than two decades, the debate around European populism, especially in, in its journalistic and its academic context, has been almost monopolized by the extreme right-wing parties that followed the impressive rise of Le Pen's Front National in France back in the late 80s. Hence, in the European context, populism soon became almost synonymous to the extreme right, denoting xenophobic, nationalist, anti-democratic, and or anti-European tendencies. But this picture was recently destabilized and diversified, as we have seen, by the emergence of various movements and parties that did not fit the extreme right banner. In fact, not a few of them could be clearly identified as left-wing or even radical left, having mine here from the course uh, in, uh, in France or Podemos now in Spain and of course uh, Syriza in Greece. While with other parties there's even a problem with categorization, uh, the example here is Bebe Grillo's Five Star Movement. After all, we should not forget that it was a left-wing movement with some even anarchist parts to which we historically owe the term populism. I have in mind here the Russian Narodvicestvo back uh, in the mid-19th century. While its North American twin, the People's Party in the United States, only some years after the Narodniki, was again registered within a democratic and maybe even a left-wing and progressive tradition. Uh, not to mention, of course, the recent wave of Latin American leftist populist governments that followed the rise of Hugo Chavez in 1998 in Venezuela. So, it seems that it was the particular recent historical developments within Europe uh, after the late 80s and early 90s uh, that have led to the rather restrictive approaches on populism that we so often see, uh, approaches that fail to conceive of populism in its vast plurality of historical manifestation, in its different ideological guises and hybrids. So, in my presentation, I purport to show that it is through a discursive framework, a formal structural approach, like the one we are proposing at the Populismus Project, that does not pre-ascribe to populism specific ideological, sociological, or other contents, 
uh, that we can register the latest developments in populist politics and comparatively assess the significance of its case and its relation to democracy in a way that is both theoretically consistent and analytically operational, and that can take into account both historical and geographical variability. Brief empirical examples from the European political landscape and from Greece will be used in order to illustrate the importance for this shift in populism research, which indeed we have already started to see in the relevant literature. But let me first offer a very quick picture of uh, what uh, Yanis Tavrakakis has described as the Eurocentric uh, approach that tends to identify populism with extreme right tendencies. Uh, Erika Meyers, in a recent collective volume entitled Populism in Europe, suggests that, quote, populists use the term people in an absolute and exclusive way. Uh, populist politicians focus on the need for more repressive and authoritative political methods while at the same time they are still harping on the old mechanisms of exclusion and xenophobic nationalism." End of quote. Another example here comes from Owen Worth's recent monograph on resistance in the age of austerity, in which national populism is presented as one of the main types of resistance to neoliberal globalization. Here, national populism is conceived of as a form of resistance that mobilizes against quote, threats to national forms of culture and life that is based upon the restoration of traditional national communities as a, mean, as a means of resisting change from above, end of quote. Strikingly, there is no definition of what Worth means by the term populist and why it is a necessary addition to the nationalist character of such forms of resistance. Last but not least, Stefano Bartolini, a professor at the European University Institute, sees populism as a malignant virus that infects democratic political systems, spreading its, quote, epidemic effects. Uh, the, this medical metaphor here gives one of the most graphic illustrations of the pathologization of populism. So let me read you two extracts from his text. Uh, the current mutation of the virus, he means populism, runs on platform related to anti-immigration, xenophobic Euroscepticism, national sovereignty, and protection of cultural ident identity, some racism, some anti-Islamism more recently. Nativism seems to be a key element. Exclusively members of the native group, the nation, should inhabit states, and non-members, people, and ideas threaten this homogeneity. But Bartolini that does not just describe populism's current mutation. He also proceeds with some generalizing remarks on populism's relation with government and policy making. Thus, and I quote, populist parties rarely govern, and when they do, they differentiate themselves from the core parties, behaving often as non-loyal members of coalitions. When in opposition, they behave usually as a semi-responsible or, or irresponsible opposition, following a politics of overpromising, Often, populist parties have ephemeral life, rising quickly and declining even sharply once the leader or the issue has lost momentum." End of quote. So what we see here is a hypostasization of populism. It is treated as an acting, as a, a need. So this is, of course, also a very European and a very uh, Western view of populism. For if Bartolini took into account the history of populism in Latin America, but also Europe and more specifically the Greece of the 80s, he would have found that left-wing populist parties have managed to form stable governments and even shape the political landscape of the countries for years after the death of their leaders. I think Peronism in Argentina here is a quite clear example. And obviously, they did not have to rely necessarily on xenophobic anti-immigration or national sentiments, but predominantly on socio-economic issues, as we have seen in the relevant literature. And this is especially the case if we focus on the more recent uh, Latin American governments that have been branded as populist. Uh, hence, such descriptions may correspond to a very specific historical momentum uh, that despite the impressive victory of Marine Le Pen in France uh, in the last European elections might already 
have started to fail. But this is, of course, a very precarious hypothesis. Uh, but this is only a particular case that cannot and should not be elevated to a universal criterion. Noam Gidron and Bart Banikowski, summarizing the, the relevant literature, describe very eloquently the diverging paths of European and Latin American populisms. I quote, in Europe, an exclusionary right-wing variant of populism emerged in the 80s, targeting mostly immigrants and national minorities. In Latin America, on the other hand, populism is rec in recent years has been mostly associated with an inclusionary vision of society, bringing together diverse ethnic identities into shared political frameworks." End of quote. Other recent approaches that purport to bridge the theory analysis gap and offer comparisons that are both meaningful and leaves space for theoretical elaboration, have also focused on this uh, antithesis between inclusion and ex uh, exclusion. Uh, one of the most interesting and rigorous such approaches is the one of Cass Mood and Cristobal Rivera Cardwasser, who also elaborated the distinction, but now mainly in geographical terms, like uh, Jan Stavrakakis has stressed in, in his introductory session. Here, Latin America is recognized as the locus of the left-wing inclusionary populism, while Europe represents the other side of the spectrum, being the locus of right-wing exclusionary populism. Even though such geographical classifications might have held some truth value until recently, it seems that today, after the proliferation of radical left parties in Europe and movements, uh, this schema needs to be reformulated. In other words, Mude and Calvas's distinction can be fruitfully utilized in the relevant research if we put aside the geographical criterion and stick to the ideological, to political discursive, the formal one, and thus investigate the specificities of left-wing populism or left-wing populisms versus the specificities of right-wing populism or right-wing populisms. So Luke March has amply demonstrated this point in his seminal study on radical left European parties, where he stresses that left-wing populism in Europe, I quote, is certainly relatively civilized because it emphasizes egalitarianism and inclusivity rather than the openly exclusivist anti-immigrant or anti-foreigner concerns of right-wing populism, i.e. its concerns is the demos, not the ethnos, end of quote, excuse me. So, what is more, in his joint work, Luke March, with Cas Mude, 10 years ago, they had observed that the emergent radical left, often articulating populist elements in its discourse, is employing, quote, new ideological approaches, principally social populism, and modern forms of transnational cooperation, particularly through the European Parliament and the anti-globalization movement, end of quote in which, of course, an inclusive, pluralist, and egalitarian worldview plays often a central role. Mirto Tsakatika and Marco Lisi have indeed registered this shift in the European radical left politics on the organizational level as an active pursuit of linkage strategies by stimulating bottom-up participation and loose network structures with social groups and movements. Inclusivity, Emphasis on, on bottom-up participation and internal pluralism, then, should not be regarded as a specific threat of Latin American left-wing populism, but rather as a possible articulation that could emerge anywhere and that is indeed now gaining momentum across the European periphery. Moreover, the antithesis between right-wing and left-wing populisms, as represented by the divide inclusion versus exclusion, could highlight the extended scope of ideological discursive frames and differentiations in accounting for political behavior. To put it in other words, we are addressing here a very usual criticism of discursive methodological orientations for dealing with mere words and declarations that might be contradicted by concrete political actions, by actual political behavior. Uh, for example, it has, be, it has been recently argued that what actually shapes the behavior of right-wing or left-wing populists in parliamentary politics is their ideological political commitments and not populism per se. Simon Oches and Tom Lovers 
have recently published in the journal Political Studies an extensive comparative study of the parliamentary behavior of the Dutch Social Party and the Party of, for Freedom, which stand as examples of left-wing and right-wing populist parties, respectively. What they find is, I quote, their left-wing or right-wing ideology is more important in guiding their behavior than their populism. And what they particularly stress is that uh, the issue to, in which we see the most characteristic contrast is the issue of immigration and the way that they perceive of national identity and popular identity. So this is something, I think, that opens up the way for creative comparisons that could articulate both discursive criteria and voting behavior of the various populist parties under scrutiny. But, I mean, voting behavior in the parliament. Indeed, um, a field where almost no research has been done until today. So to build uh, upon a bit uh, this argument, I will very briefly refer to the recent debate in Greece regarding the issue of a law granting citizenship to second generation immigrants and especially to the children of immigrants, uh, the so-called Dragousis law, he was the minister. Uh, so. It was a public debate that brought forth in the public sphere very diverging conceptions of the Greek people as a collective subject vis-a-vis -vis its others. <laughs> Thus, we could compare here the parliamentary behavior of Syriza and independent Greeks, from now on, Anel. Uh, so it is particularly interesting to compare these two parties, since they have been both characterized as populist in both journalists and academic analysis. And indeed, even after a cursory glance at the discourse, one immediately establishes that they indeed articulate their appeals in a populist manner, interpolating and constructing the people as a collective subject against the ruling elite, the power bloc. What is more, those two parties have officially kept an open door to potential collaboration with each other and against the government in the future due to their common anti-austerity agenda and despite all their differences. Uh, so the public debate on the citizenship law that was ratified by the parliament in 2010 when the center-left PASOK was in power and, and was then challenged uh, by the center-right New Democracy government only three years after, uh, revealed a very sharp contrast in the conceptualization of the people within the Greek political party system, which was also played out in the antagonistic conceptions that Syriza and Anel offered. So, very briefly, Anel was vehemently against the citizenship law, arguing that it was actually blood that made you Greek. You have to be born of Greek parents, and that there needed to be a genuine and very strong bond of any individual that were to be granted citizenship. In their rationale, the duty of the law is to, and I quote, ensure it manages to safeguard the ethnic homogeneity of the state with absolute respect to the concept of the nation, end of quote. But how do they define the nation? So according to Anel, another quote, the nation is an entity that exceeds temporarily the living community of people and the geographical borders of the Greek state. Thus, the lawmaker should not permit the inclusion to the popular community, the people, of foreign persons that do not have a true bond with this community, the nation. So, as they clarify further, a person can never become a part of the Greek people if she or he does not have a properly Greek national consciousness. Lastly, their narrative is overwhelmed by the image of an invasion from what they call illegal immigrants that threatened to erode the ethnic homogeneity of the Greek people with its destructive consequences for the nation and its polity. And what is considered to be particularly under threat is the Greek family. Uh, so, not surprisingly then, Anel supported the efforts of the new democracy government to scrap the law and replace it with another one that would, not be that would now be very strict in granting citizenship even to children that were born and raised in Greece. So contrary to the Anel, Syriza maintained that the citizenship law should go even further in a progressive and liberal direction 
and stood against this scrapping by, the, by New Democracy. Uh, in the counter proposal that Syriza drafted rec very recently, uh, we find a vivid description of what the party understands as the Greek people. Thus, for Syriza, the definition of the boundaries of the political community lies within the people itself and their representatives' sovereign right. And those boundaries are never static or dependent on some ethnic substance. Uh, I quote, Greek citizens are not the holders of a national metaphysical substance, but those who have lived, live, or will live in our country with a Greek citizenship, end of quote. Uh, Syriza thus supports that it is a matter of democratic sovereign political decision to set the terms along which the community of the people is defined, confined, or expanded. We find then here not an ethnic community defined in an essentialist way, strongly related to a quasi-metaphysical substance, but rather a political community that decides for itself the expansion of its limits. And to give just another hint about the, the emptiness of the signifier of the people that we have already discussed about, uh, which is something very characteristic in Syriza's discourse. When Alexis Tsipras is uh, asked to define the people, to, uh, what do you mean uh, when you call upon the people? Who, is, who are these people? His answer is that, uh, let me find the quote. The people consists of those who live, suffer, and struggle within our country. So it could be practically, practically everybody. So to sum up, what we see in this contrast that I very briefly uh, tried to sketch out is not, of course, a bad right-wing populism versus a good left-wing populism, far from it. What we see is the variability of populist articulations, the contrastic meanings that are attributed to the people as a subject, and the different ways in which the antagonism with an establishment can be articulated. To put it in other words, we see very different and diverging conceptions of collective identity, of collective subjectivity. Although political researchers have done a lot of work to analyze the, char the characteristics of Latin American left-wing populism until today, almost no work has been done in order to understand and critically assess left-wing populism in Europe. It seems like an urgent priority then to critically assess left-wing populism in Europe, to uh, account for its inclusionary aspects in a comparative and cross-regional perspective in order to fill this significant gap in the relevant bi bibliography marked by the equation of European populism with the extreme right and an exclusivist, if not xenophobic, worldview. What is more, our approach is to take a more formal, structural and discursive character in order to allow for comparisons beyond the restrictions of specific ideological, political, geographical or organizational contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Giorgo. And our last speaker in this panel, Georgi Medarov, The Transformations of Liberal Antipopulism in Post-1989 Bulgaria. Georgi. Thank you. Uh, just let me, yeah. So I will, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I will trace the transformations of liberal anti-populist discourses since uh, the 1990s in Bulgaria. So by anti-populist, I mean, on the one hand, uses of the signifier populism, not in terms of a theory of populism, but as a danger to liberal democracy that needs to be uprooted by liberal technocrats. And on the other hand, uh, I mean, various elitist forms of opposing uh, the people, be that uh, via anxiety about the supposed irres irresponsibility or irrationality of the crowd, the masses, and so on, or attacking the very use of notions such as the people in political struggles as ideological ma manipulation, demagoguery, and so on and so forth. To this end, I rely on Ernesto Laclos' formal approach and the uh, Essex School more generally uh, that conceptu conceptualizes political identification via articulation of differential demands into chain of equivalence. The chain itself enchained to a master demand Uh, there is an empty signifier marking the limits of the political subject by pointing towards its shared enemy. There is itself negatively constituting political identities. What I'm also trying to do is to question assumptions of a clear border between institutional logic that is based on differential meeting of democratic demands preventing the articulation of populist subject and populist subject arising out of anomie or crisis. When 
that is when it is no longer possible to meet differentiated demands in individualized manner by efficient administration. By collapsing oppositions between administrative institutionalization and populist political resistance, order and anomy, stability and crisis, liberal governance and democratic resistance can help, it seems to me, uh, see how uh, liberal democracy is, uh, is always already open to redrawing of its boundaries, that is to say, along the lines of Chantal Mouffe's democratic paradox. My main argument is that populism and anti-populism in Bulgaria is neither a remnant from the socialist part, uh, past, sorry, uh, nor an ill effect of inefficient or unaccomplished transition to liberal capitalism, but on the contrary, the specter of populism had been the constitutive outside of contemporary Bulgarian liberalism itself. There are two important aspects here. Firstly, liberal anti-populist discourses are obviously not the, so, not the only ones that had been constitutive of liberal political identities, but functioned along other technocratic discourses revolving around signifiers such as anti-corruption, transparency, good European practices, as well as anti-communism embedded in a teleology of transition from totalitarianism to liberal democracy. Importantly, this uh, uh, teleology of transition was posited as a gradual displacement of uh, state government with civil society governance, the latter being represented by experts on democratization, liberal think tanks, and so on and so forth. And secondly, if one perceives order and crisis as inherently interlinked, it is key to see how those empty signifiers have constantly turned into floating ones in various political struggles, thereby redrawing the frontier of liberal identities and reshuffling their chains of equivalence. Moreover, those signifiers are not the exclusive privilege of elites, but became operational in a number of grassroots protest movements. Liberal anti-populism, along with the rest of the nodal points partially fixing liberal political identities, uh, has gone deep transformations in, severe, in several political conjunctures, which I sketch briefly in the rest of this paper. So after 89, uh, in Bulgaria, a two-party model was formed that pitted the ex-communist Bulgarian Socialist Party, that is BSP, against the newly formed anti-communist coalition called uh, the United Democratic Forces, the UDF. Both shared a common vision for a transition to liberal capitalism and their distinctions were projected onto the past. Liberal capitalism itself was promised to dissolve privileges in inequality and inequalities of the socialist state into a sort of a universal affluent middle class. The socialist past, however, was seen by BSP as an integral part of national history and pre-socialism, the, the time before socialism, presented as a fascist barbarism. Uh, UDF, on the other hand, had their main slogan, 45 years is enough, claiming socialism was a break with na authentic national history, cutting the links with a supposed pre-socialist developed bourgeois democracy. According to UDF, this necessitated a radical break with the past via economic shock therapy. And for BSP, on the other hand, liberal capitalism was to be achieved by a gradualist reform. BSP formed a government in 94, supported by rural populations at the time, on a mandate to tame the most radical liberal reforms in agriculture. BSP's contradictory attempts to engineer a humane neoliberalization, however, by, say, retaining national price controls, but at the same time liberalizing foreign trade in agriculture, uh, failed dramatically in a severe banking crisis, staple food shortages, and hyperinflation in the end of 96. All this brought mass anti-communist mobilization that toppled the government in 97. UDF blamed the so-called unreformed communists and won the 97 elections on a shock therapy mandate as a way out of the crisis. UDF presented this as a choice between the abnormal Asian communist historic deflection and, uh, on the other hand, the desired return to the supposed uh, Euro-Atlantic normality. Austerity dubbed un unpopular measures at the time was presented as temporary but necessary evil needed to aid the anti-communist desire for purification from, an, from the imagined entity of totalitarianism. The signifier of uh, unpopular measures, however, was not subsumed under a more general anti-populist discourse. Austerity was not articulated vis-a-vis -vis the people or populism, but as a temporal punishment for the socialist historic deviation, and also it promised an end to misery into a kind of a universal welfare in future. 
uh, the 97-2001 UDF government marks the consolidation of the neoliberal consensus and the dissolution of the 1990s uh, two-party mo two party model. In 2001, the exiled heir of the throne, that is Simeon Saxe-Coburgotha, returned to Bulgaria from Spain and formed a new political party called NDCV with explicit expert technocratic agenda and won the elections. It is precisely this institutionalization of the liberal hegemony that brought the notion of populism within mainstream political discourse. Here populism, as understood by Bulgarian liberals at least, signifies not so much a concrete political subject, but a populist situation. M mainstream Bulgarian liberal intellectuals have argued populism should not be or understood as a danger to democracy per se, but as a constant threat of excessive democratic but illiberal temptation to contest the liberal consensus, or to borrow Ivan Kristev's phrase, democratic illiberalism, that had to be uh, countered by liberal technicians. In other words, the very consolidation of liberalism, rendering all political parties the same, disintegrated the boundaries of the 90s political identifications and posed the menace for electoral mobilization. And as uh, other mainstream Bulgarian liberals have argued, at that time, after 2001, liberalism became a victim of its own success. From the perspective of the discursive approach, the post-2011 emergence of populism in mainstream political discourse does not point towards a new populist practices, but to the constitutive outside of liberalism itself in the context of the post-political liberal hegemony. Post-2001, liberal anti-populism is precisely a discursive strategy for constituting a supposed illiberal but democratic external frontier needed for the articulation and the recuperation of the liberal subject itself. Initially, the specter of populism was projected onto the far-right party attacker, which emerged in 2005 as a reaction to the liberal consensus. But liberals ins insisted the supposed danger of populism exists also in mainstream parties and needs to be tamed. Attaka itself became more mainstream and supported two governments. There is the center-right uh, government of GERP after 2009 and the nominally center-left government after 2013 of the led by Bulgarian Socialist uh, Party. And uh, after they supported the government in 2009, uh, experts uh, uh, dubbed it uh, as a tamed populist, that is Attaka. And the CV and GERP uh, reliance on charismatic leaders and their sometimes antagonistic rhetorics were also uh, dubbed uh, often populist, but uh, explicitly dubbed as a soft populist and hence safe, and were often compared to the supposed acceptable populism of uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, for example. Another effect of the post-2001 liberal consensus was that none of the political parties was able to contain the nodal points fixing their identities, this means all major empty signifiers became floating ones, being mobilized in a variety of directions and ways. For instance, the struggle against corruption was initially used to build liberal chains of equivalence able to accommodate white discontent with capitalism. The narrative about corruption fixed liberal identities by stating it is not capitalism per se to be blamed, but only the fact that we don't yet have a real transition, a real market, a real competition, a real civil society, and so on and so forth. However, all political parties used anti-corruption rhetorics against their opponents, thus eventually excluding the whole political elite from the liberal chain of equivalence they were trying to form. All political parties uh, came to be seen as corrupt, and anti-corruption became the nodal point in a series of protest mobilizations, mostly environmentalists against privatization of natural parks, but also against uh, shale gas fracking and against the liberalization of GMO food production. This shift was especially pronounced after 2009 when uh, the new, a newly created center-right party, this GERP that I mentioned, formed a government with the support of the far-right. Uh, GERP, who, uh, which is led by Boyko Borisov, who is a next karate fighter who started his political career as the personal bodyguard of Todor Zhivkov. This is the head of state of the socialist state before 89. And also, Boyko Borisov was the personal bodyguard of the ex-king who returned in 2001. So this, he started his political career like this. And in 2009, he won full majority uh, on a mandate to fight corruption. The difficulty to sustain that narrative, uh, however, the anti-corruption narrative, forced GERP 
to complement it with uh, anti-communist and anti-Turkish rhetorics. N nevertheless, GERP's anti-communism is not of the 1990s type. It is uh, completely new and able to integrate the widespread nostalgia for Zhivkov with anti-communism. This anti-communism is not directed against the past, but against the present, combining remnants of both UDF and BSP political discourses from the 90s into new floating signifiers. Borisov also spread conspiracies about secret communist and secret Turkish plots interfering with his rule, trying to kill him, and so on and so forth. Anti-communism shifts away uh, discontent from capitalism and projects it into its supposed corrupt form, scapegoating minorities and an imagined shadow elite, facilitating widespread conspiracy thinking among the elite. However, GERP could not retain a monopoly over its own rhetorics. The government was severely attacked for being corrupt, and Borisov himself was often blamed for being a communist in disguise. During GERP's government, liberal anti-populist discourses were explicitly directed against protest mobilizations that were called populist and thus, thus their demands illegitimate. Moreover, in cases when the government succumbed to protest demands, this was also explained as a result from populist pressure. For example, uh, GERP imposed a ban on shale gas fracking after massive protest mobilization, but later Boyko Borisov blamed his own party members of being the victims of uh, so-called environmental populism. Oppositional part political parties also branded GERP as populist because of its inability to resist protest demands. Liberal anti-populism dire directed against protest movements culmin culminated in uh, February 2013 when the highly acclaimed stability regime uh, between 2009 and 2013, which managed to cut budget deficit from 4% in uh, 2010 to 1% in uh, 2012. So this government fell in the midst of mass protests that were uh, called populist by uh, liberal intellectuals and activists. What liberal commenta commentators missed, nevertheless, was that the February protests in 2013 used uh, key liberal signifiers, precisely anti-corruption, but also anti-monopoly and mostly civil society, and not so much the people, to form popular chains of equivalence. Liberal signifiers, as I mentioned, are not privileged objects of elites, but dispersed and lend themselves to uh, popular appropriations. Such was the case uh, precisely in February 2013, when people marched for nationalization of the energy providers precisely under the banner of anti-monopoly, free market, and anti-corruption. Protesters demanded direct civil society rule and abolishment of political parties. In other words, they hijacked chief signifiers of the transition against, uh, its for, uh, against their former carriers, that is, against the political elite and liberal experts. What was challenged were not liberal empty signifiers per se, however, but their representatives, and even political representation as such. In this presentist movement, civil society, and not so much the people, as I mentioned, was mobilized as a weapon against political mediation, that is parties, and even against economic mediation, against the electricity distribution companies, in a popular political uh, subject calling for all power to the civil society. A new government was formed in uh, uh, May 2013, by, uh, it was a coalition government, led by uh, BSP, but also DPS, this is a liberal party supported by the Turkish minority, and also the government was, uh, the new coalition government was supported by the far right once again. Protests demanding the resignation of this government erupted in Sofia uh, last summer over the controversial appointment of a media mogul as the head of the national security. Initially, demonstrations were large with participants on all sides of the political spectrum. Gradually, the protests contracted however, as they were monopolized by liberal activists and, excuse me, and uh, ex-UDF intellectuals who saw this movement as a way to return to power by reviving the 1990s anti-communism. Protesters called for European values, morality in politics, and a genuine break with communism. Liberal activists, explicitly supported by big business, asserted cynically that the poor protested in February, while now it is the middle class that marches for welfare, but not, uh, so I'm sorry, that marches not for welfare, but for values against the shadow elite. 
In so doing, they revived the 90s anti-communism in the imaginary figure of the unproductive parasitic communist oligarch pulling the strings from behind and brainwashing the masses with populist ideology. A mainstream liberal economist, even, in a, uh, his uh, kind of a pseudo class analysis, wrote that uh, the, uh, the following pseudo class analysis. So he claimed that the unproductive oligarchy provides welfare and the poor, he called them proletarians, provide votes. But now, with the summer pro protest from last year, according to him, we are seeing the productive bourgeoisie uh, rising against this alliance. In that sense, uh, the signifier of a middle class uh, started to become a much more exclusive category if it is compared to the 1990s. Unlike the 90s, when anti-communist protests raised genuinely anti-elity slogans such as power to the people or down with the red bourgeoisie, the 2013 protests were pronouncedly anti-populist, presenting themselves as the quality against the quantity, the quantity of apathetic non-supporters of the protesters or they used oppositions like the GDP generators against the parasites on welfare, the creators of value versus the faceless crowd. I'm not claiming those groups pre-exist their naming sociologically, but that they were constituted performatively in a political struggle in the very process of naming. Those divisions were also adopted by supporters of the government and thus stabilized further. Now, to be a liberal anti-populist meant to protest on daily on the street, there, was, there were even riots in support of austerity and against populism uh, in, a, in a movement that uh, claimed there is a shadow elite trying to derail Bulgaria from the EU. Uh, the movement also portrayed bankers as communists, used extremely antagonistic, sometimes racializing and even dehumanizing terms against the supposed manipulated silent majority. And at the same time, uh, this movement was explicitly supported by all anti-populist uh, liberal intellectuals and activists. Populism was now projected onto the government, despite that in terms of a, any concrete policies, there was no practical change. What was formative to the new temporal fixation of liberal identities, uh, it seems to me, was rather the opposition to the very chance of demonopolization of, of liberal signifiers, such as civil society, a chance that manifested itself for a short moment in February 2013. It seems to me also interesting if such a chance can convert the liberal specter of populism into a material force. But this, however, would be rather a political and not a strictly a theoretical question. <laughs>